Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And today's topic is, hmm, that's right, it's about dragons and dragon riders. Where have all the dragon riders gone? Particularly for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Now, yes, I am aware that there is a homebrew dragon rider class. That is not what this video is about. If you want to go and check out that, if you Google it, you will find it. it. It does exist. If you want to use it, great. Fantastic. Not what this video is actually about, though. There were so many dragon riders in the past for Dungeons & Dragons. Dragonlance is a really good example. This is a, a campaign that was run for many years with players and dungeon masters who had characters who rode dragons. So what happened? Somewhere along the line, somebody has decided this is a bad idea. And I can kind of understand why, but I want to provide you with a bit more foresight into what you can do with regard to dragon riders and how to approach it. Now we really see the dragon rider in Dungeons and Dragons 5e games. I don't know that I have seen many dungeon masters ever do this, uh, except for myself. I think there may be one other individual I've ever met who's actually um, done something with dragon riders. So why are there no dragon riders in Dungeons and Dragons 5e? Why are there no dragon riders that people are using in their games? Hmm, well we know why. Okay, we can say ultimately that it's the dungeon master, but a lot of people would say, well actually it's to do with the fact that there are no rules. There's no rules for Dungeons and Dragons 5e to actually run uh, Dragon Riders. Nothing that's balanced and works and, you know, uh, so how do I do it? That's not there. There's actually enough basic information on skills in the skill section to, for you to be able to figure out a lot of this. And if you look back at sort of the, the kind, kind of concepts regarding actually being a Dragon Rider, you can sort of piece together enough as a Dungeon Master to figure it out. And I would Ultimately, if you start using skill checks to uh, work through the process of um, somebody playing a character who rides a dragon, use high checks. Use a DC 20 or DC 30 or do DC 25. Do, do, make it hard. Make it difficult. It should be hard to ride a dragon. It shouldn't be something that's easy. Another reason or rationale behind the fact that there are not that many uh, dragon riders is that, well... Ultimately, other players and the Dungeon Master view it as being overpowered. And yes, having a dragon as a mount is certainly extremely overpowered. But there are ways of dealing with that. And often the response to not having dragon riders in a game is a response of Dungeon Master fear. A lack of control or an increase in workload. Now I can guarantee that having dragon riders in your game is going to increase your workload. That's definitely uh, there. Rule complexity. The rules are now becoming more complex. There's going to be synergies working with all the existing rules on top of what I've had to create to make this work. How do I deal with that? And honestly, uh, for a character or anybody to become a dragon rider, there's a lot of requirements. It's quite tough. It's not an easy road. Not everybody can do it. Therefore, there shouldn't really necessarily be that many dragon riders, right? So, but what do you do when the, uh, the player's character decides to jump onto that dragon? That's right. Some player decides they're flying around and then suddenly, let's just jump on top of the dragon. And they do. They give it a go. That's right. They line themselves up. They have a go, and you've got to try and figure out how to make this all work. And you're thinking, well, hang on, if they jump onto there, well, that's the thing. Just make it up. Use the, the rules that you have. Use your acrobatics. Use your athletics. Use your dexterity saving throws. Use your dex checks. Use all the things that you have access to to figure out how to make it work. It's not going to be easy, right? You're going to make it difficult, as it should be. And, of course... The dragon might not be willing for them to jump onto the back, and therefore you're going to have to make it even more difficult. But the process and discussion regarding what do you do when a player's character jumps onto a dragon, that's another video. We'll leave that for another day, because I think that requires a lot more effort on my part and explanation. Okay, 
The reason that there are hardly any uh, dragon riders is because, well, Wizards of the Coast hasn't made any rules, but they don't really use dragon riders in their games and their adventures. There's very few of them, right? They don't actually seem to pop up that often. When has that ever stopped you, as a dungeon master, from doing something in your game? Really? That's going to stop you? You can't tell me right now that having a dragon rider in your game is not something. This scene I'm showing you right now with the castle wall, the adventurers, and a dragon rider here, whether it be a player sitting on this dragon or somebody else, it doesn't matter. You can't tell me that isn't memorable for you and the players. You can't tell me that as a dungeon master, you don't want to have dragon riders in your game. I can't even imagine excluding that from my game. Not only that, you absolutely know that your players more than likely would love to have something like that. It doesn't have to happen all the time, but certainly, why not? Okay, you have questions. You have many, many questions. More questions than I can pro probably answer. I'm going to do my best to work through as many of these questions as I possibly can. So I like the, the what, where, how, when, who, all that sort of stuff. We've sort of talked a little bit about that process already. So there are like three different ways you can use your dragon riders in the game, right? There are three basic locations and ways that you can incorporate those dragon riders. And the first one is the one that you are most frightened of, and that is the players having a mount that is a dragon. Now remember, there's a lot of requirements. We're going to talk about those, don't you worry. So players could have a dragon as a mount. Why not at high level? I did it at high level. I did it when I was running uh, the Tyranny of Dragons. I ran through Horde of the Dragon Queen, the Rise of Tiamat, and uh, during the Rise of Tiamat, they, they rode dragons into battle. They absolutely did. Did they do it a lot? No. But I had at least one or two battles where they did. And certainly later on, the opportunity to do more of that arose. So at high level, it makes sense. I can totally understand not wanting to do it at low level because to have a dragon who's essentially acting independently and if it's willing to, to hang around with the adventurers is probably going to crush all of your monsters. In fact, the party won't be necessary. They just say, okay, we'll go and um, have a barbecue and the dragon can go and uh, destroy the, uh, the dungeon monsters because there's just nothing that can possibly stand up to that thing. Okay, and look, it's happened in my game where players uh, actually had a baby dragon and that baby dragon was actually probably more powerful over time than they were, and they'd actually leave the baby dragon, the character or player who was running that particular character, who the baby dragon, would leave the baby dragon behind. It would go and do its own thing, as it often um, dragons will. Dragons won't always show up. They're going to have their own set of uh, priorities. They won't always be available to ride. You can use those dragons, those dragon riders, for NPCs. NPCs that can help out the party. They don't have to be there for a long time, but they can be there for a short period of time. That's really up to you. And how much you use them is it's really, again, completely up to you. But a non-player character controlled by the NPC who rides a dragon, oh, fantastic. You can't tell me you can't include that in your game. Here's the best one. What about a villain? You stick a, a villain on a dragon. You can't tell me that that isn't going to add something to your game. What would a, a villain like to do with a dragon mount? All sorts of terrible, nasty things. It's just lifting your, your, your game and the experience to another level. And it makes sense. Your villain is the main villain. It should have the best mount. What's the best mount you could have, short of riding on Tarrasque? Well, again, Tarrasque is nice, but it doesn't fly. Unless, of course, you've decided to make your Tarrasques fly. But a dragon, that's a different story. It's the best mount a villain that you have included in your game could possibly have. You have a lich and now has a dracolich as a mount. You have a, a main uh, mage, evil mage. It has a flying dragon. It could be any dragon you like. Could be black, could be red. Pick a colour, doesn't matter, really. Um, of course, sort of helps if they are aligned with the, uh, the villain that you are role playing in your game. But again, take your pick. There are many to select from. Okay, so now you want some nuts and bolts. Like, what are some of the things that you would require 
from your players or from your villain or from your NPC to actually be able to have a dragon mount? Well, there's actually quite a few that I could think of, um, which doesn't make the process any easier than it was before trying to explain and suggest to somebody to include them in their game, but let's work through what I've got so far. So how do you become a dragon rider? Well, first thing is you are going to need a willing dragon. That's right, somebody is going to have to go and find a willing dragon. Now, how, how easy is that? Probably not very easy. So that's got a lot, of, that's a lot of work on the player's part to actually achieve that. That in itself is difficult, but there's more. <laughs> that dragon is not going to need a saddle. Do you think you can just wear and ride this dragon bareback and you'll stay on? Chances are you will fall off. You're likely to need a harness of some kind, and this saddle and harness will have to be fitted to the dragon so it doesn't interfere with its ability to fly, and it does feel like it's comfortable. Remember, your dragon might decide that it does not like having the harness, and therefore, it, whatever you do, it might require a bit of work put in and a bit of money outlay to actually get a decent saddle and harness to allow you to ride on it. Will this dragon actually allow you to have reins? Ooh. I don't know that there's going to be too many dragons that will allow that. If you can pull it off, wonderful. If you can't, it's not going to work. All right, what about the rider needing some sort of training? Yeah, probably will need some sort of training. So how long will that take? Make up a number. It could be months, it could be years, it could be weeks. It might be um, an even shorter period of time. You set the limits on that. It's really completely up to you. There's no sort of absolute with regard to how long it would take to train to be able to ride a dragon. And also too, you're going to have to have some sort of uh, natural skills, not just natural skills, but at least reasonable skills allowing you to actually make sure you can stay on this creature. I would imag imagine something like a high dexterity would be actually quite useful to maintain balance. I mean, really, that's what it's about. Staying on a, a creature that flies is going to be much more difficult than staying on a horse. Okay, that's a totally different kettle of fish. What about all of that treasure? You're going to have to share your treasure with your dragon mount. Did you think about that? Um, it has its own dragon horde that it needs to actually develop because remember at some point it's going to have to have offspring and that offspring needs a treasure hoard to actually lie on and if you're depending on the type of dragon it might actually have to consume that kind of uh, those rare gems and, uh, and, and precious metals so therefore you will have to outlay quite a lot of your own treasure and obviously have access to and an ongoing access to more treasure, one for breeding and one to feed the creature if it actually consumes precious metals and gems. Ho! Oh, now if it doesn't eat those sorts of things and doesn't need it for breeding, you still got the issue of a dragon has got like a natural um, instinct to create a dragon horde. So you can't, you can't ignore it, you can't say, well it, this dragon is not going to worry about that sort of thing, because that's not going to work. Remember, it's now essentially an independent creature. Dragons have their own rules, their own set of uh, thoughts, feelings, and how they operate. That dragon's going to need time to go and hunt for food. Ooh, are you thinking you're going to feed this dragon? Well, maybe you can. But does the dragon actually want to be fed, or will you need to allow it to go off and do its own thing so that it can collect food? And of course, it's got to go and hunt for food in the appropriate location because going and plucking the the sheep and cows from the local farmer probably not going to go down too well. <laughs> You're going to need enough wealth to support the dragon's upkeep. There's quite a few different things going on with the dragon and I've already talked about quite a lot of that already. So that means that really this is really an option only for a high level character, not a low level character. So you don't have to worry about the fact that low level characters might have a dragon because that's not really ever going to happen is it? How do you deal with civilizations? Oh, there's a civilization I want to visit. Well, the problem is that most civilizations and civilized people and cultures and so forth are just going to be terrified of your dragon mount. You can't just ride into town or into the city and land. That is just going to cause all sorts of problems. So 
yet again, one of those issues. Yes, you could say, well, out just outside of the outskirts of the town, I will get off the dragon, let it do its thing, and um, I will, we'll, we'll meet back up later on while I do my business in the civilized area. But then every time you meet a new NPC while you're adventuring and you've got your dragon around, what is their response going to be to the fact that you have a dragon as a mount? Is it going to be fear? Are they going to want to um, aid you and assist you? Or are they just going to wind up putting up barriers that you have to deal with? All things to consider, right? Your dragon will need custom armor that is strong and light. That means, yet again, more expense. It's getting expensive to have this dragon, isn't it? So you're going to have to find somebody capable who knows how to actually make armor for a dragon. So you've got to find somebody skilled enough. You've got to have enough wealth. You've got to make sure it's made out of something that's strong and light. And does a dragon need to actually have armor? It's got natural armor, you're thinking. Well, that might be the case. Maybe you decide, I won't put armor on this thing. Maybe the dragon doesn't like the idea of having armor in the first place. But if you start facing off against other dragons, then putting armor on your dragon might in fact be a very smart idea. It's an extra layer of defense, right? Or is it not an extra layer of defense? So, something to consider depending on the type of dragon you've got and whether the dragon will actually allow you to uh, apply armor to that creature. What about the animal handling check? Hmm, do I need to engage in an animal handling check? Do I need to make persuasion checks since this is quite an intelligent creature? It's not really like an animal as such. It's got, it's smarter than I am and I'm the rider. Do I have to, uh, do I have to do this every time I want to get the dragon to do something? Or will it just go and do its own thing? Will it actually be more of a liability than a bonus to me? Having a dragon as a mount seems like a wonderful idea, but only if the dragon has the same ideas and is willing to cooperate with the rider and do what the rider wants. And the rider might not necessarily make um, smart uh, decisions, whereas the dragon is probably a lot smarter than the rider, as I said. We're talking about an independent mount now. What happens with an independent mount? Well, one, you've got to try and control it, which, of course, you're not because you're allowing it to be acting independently. And an independent mount gets its own attack. That means breath weapons. That means carnage. That means it can do a lot of damage. That means having to adjust things. That might well mean having to adjust things. It gets its own attacks. It's got frightful presence. Are you using the dragons as they are written in the monster manual? Or are you going to modify the dragon so it's playable or usable by your player's character? Or don't you need to worry about that because it's going to be an NPC or a villain using this dragon? Again, things to consider. Okay, yes we know, dragon riders, dragons are overpowered. And yes, you will have to adjust your monsters and your enemies and your creatures. Because really there isn't really any other choice, is there? What else are you going to do? You, you can't just sort of leave it there. So you will have to make some adjustments and changes. What happens for a rider on a, uh, a dragon? Is this just a fast travel uh, method? Or do we need to consider combat? How does a rider on a dragon actually fight without getting in the way? Because let's get real, there is a head moving around, there's a tail swinging about, there are wings flapping. So how does a rider use weapons and fight on a mount? Ha! Uh, that's a good question, really. Well, I would suggest to you that something like a sword or a mace or anything like that being swung is probably not very useful because really the dragon's doing all of that. If you're up close, how are you supposed to get in, in close enough? The dragon's got a longer neck and longer reach than you do. Okay, so you're saying, okay, let's go with the, the spear and the lance. Well, yet again, more likely to get in the way. So the only time that a rider is ever going to be using a, a melee or close quarter weapon is really when they have to get off the dragon or they have, they're pushed into no other um, um, choice but to have to engage in close quarter combat with somebody while they're on the dragon or they get off the dragon to uh, engage in close quarter combat. So really the kind of weapon that you have as a rider is not going to be the sword or the axe or even the spear or lance because it's really a one-shot uh, attack, and after that, it's done. So what is a good weapon to use on a mount? That's a dragon. Let's go with bows. Long bow might be just a bit too long, but what about a short bow? Now, you can fire a short bow 
either forward, provided the head is uh, not moving around too much because you don't want to shoot the, um, the dragon in the back of the head, that would be bad. You can shoot backwards, which would be really useful to the dragon if it's being pursued. So as so long as you can turn in the saddle uh, and in your harness and fire your bow backwards, could be useful. Firing to the side, again, a problem, particularly if the dragon is flapping. But if it's just gliding, yes, you could do that. What about bombs? Is there some sort of bomb or um, a shrapnel that you can drop on your enemies that are on the ground? Kind of hard to target anything if you're flying high, so you'd have to fly down quite low to be able to be effective in that way. Does that mean you can back it up with the dragon breath as you drop your bombs? Possibly. I would say to you that probably the most useful weapon that you can have as a dragon rider is going to be something like magic. Let's get real. If you are on a dragon, magic is the no-brainer because the chances are you don't have to worry about hitting um, or damaging your, the creature you're on because of the nature of the types of spells that you can cast. Many spells are going to be vastly more useful. It's just like the bow. The only difference is it does better things than the bow does. So, magic. Definitely, magic casters on a dragon work fantastic. Whether that be a player a non-player character, or your villain. Look, I would like to think that this has covered most of the things you might have wanted to talk about with regard to dragon riders. Now, this might have been useful for players and dungeon masters. I'm not too sure. It's not really designed to really uh, be an option as a player where you can go to your dungeon master and say, look, this is what Fred said. Let's try this. That's not really what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is more dungeon masters be a bit more open to the idea of having dragon riders in your game in some form or another, because it is dungeons and dragons after all. Now I have hundreds of videos for players and dungeon masters, which you are welcome to go and check out if you want to, so feel free to go and peruse my selection, there are so many options out there now. I have a Patreon page where you can go and uh, support me there. I also have affiliate links down in the uh, description to the book depository and Amazon where you can support me in the channel so I keep doing videos like this. I also have a merchandise shelf just below the video which you can also buy merch regarding Keep Rolling Your Twenties which is my catch catchphrase. And hey, look, share, like and subscribe. Hit the bell button to be notified when I go live and when I publish new videos and I do a lot of them as a lot of my subscribers will know. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.